This is the story of Christina Jacobina Beck. It was 1866. In the United States, the Civil War was almost over. The 14th Amendment was passed. Jesse James robbed his first bank. The first machine-made sewing needles were manufactured. The first train robbery happened. And half a world away in Denmark, a 15-year-old girl stood on the docks in Copenhagen Harbor and looked out to sea, thinking of a new life in a new land. Christina Jacobina Beck was 15. It's true, but if asked, she would probably have pointed out that she was almost 16. In fact, she would turn 16 just days after the family sailed for America. The wind blew off the water, her long skirts billowed out behind her, and her hair, caught up in a ribbon, blew straight out. The move had been planned for a long time. There was the land to sell, along with most of their possessions. They could take so few things with them. Still, some purchases had to be made. Provisions for the journey, food, medicine. They weren't sure exactly what they would need, but it would be best to be prepared. Christina was the oldest in the family and always had many responsibilities for the cooking, the sewing, the caring for her brothers. And now they were leaving, leaving behind Skibstead, where she had been born and christened in the small village church, and where she had lived on the farm Fugelholt, leaving Saltum, where her father had been a schoolteacher after they left the farm, leaving friends and family and everything, and for what? A new life. The plans were set in motion when the men had come to the village talking about a new church started by a young boy in America. Christina's family was taken with the preaching, and they were baptized by immersion in the ways of the new church. And then they felt the tug to go to America to join with the saints, as they were called. But it wasn't only the church. It was the promise of America, where land was abundant and free for the taking, where there were new opportunities, where the streets were paved with gold. Well, Christina didn't believe that last part. No one did, really. But the possibilities sounded golden. Christina's family was well enough off in Denmark. Her mother's people had come from Germany, and when her parents married, they inherited a life lease on a large farm. In time, this was sold, and they purchased a property with farmland, and also a dance hall and a lunch and soft drink parlor, which was operated during the winter months. The estate was named Fugelholt, home of the birds. But when Christina's mother decided to join this new American church, she was baptized in a small creek, and several days later, when Christina's father went into the city for supplies, someone asked if it was true that his wife had joined the strange new church. He knew that she was drawn to it, but he was not aware of her baptism. He returned home to ask Hannah if what he'd heard was true. And when she said that it was, he told her to keep as quiet and as quiet as possible so that they could get a good price for the land before they left for America. He knew well that those who joined the American church were subject to teasing and worse. So the land was sold at a good price, enough to pay for the family to emigrate and to help six other families as well. Finally, the day arrived and Christina stood on the docks, looking west to her new life. With her family, father, mother, younger siblings, Christina boarded the sailing ship Kenilworth. That was on May 20th, 1866. The ship was old and just barely seaworthy. During the voyage, it caught fire three times, and in fact, this was Kenilworth's last voyage. It was scrapped when they reached New York. The voyage was not easy. It took eight weeks. Many were sick. Christina's brother, only five months old, died just ten days before they reached America and was buried at sea, a sight that stayed with her for her entire life. When their family reached the destination in New York, it was not the glorious welcome they had hoped for. The dock was filled with people who did not want more immigrants coming to their land. They called out names and told them to go back where they came from. It was unbearably hot when they disembarked, and in the next few days, several of their company who had managed to survive the voyage took sick and died. The rest were loaded onto cattle cars and rushed first to Boston and then to Omaha, Nebraska, a trip that took two weeks. And here in Omaha, they prepared for the long journey west. They had not been able to bring much from Denmark, but in Omaha, they were forced to leave behind more of their things. Christina's little sister, Dorothy Marie, had a precious doll with a china head. She begged to take it, but there was just not enough room. Finally, she removed the china head 
from the soft body, left the body, and took only the head with her in the wagon, with the promise of a new body when they were settled. But in fact, the doll was never reconstructed. Dorothy Marie exchanged it for a large black hen to supply the family with much-needed eggs. Teams and wagons were waiting in Omaha to take them across the plains, but here again there was a scarcity. All who could walk did. Christina walked the entire way from Omaha, Nebraska, to the Salt Lake Valley in what was then the Utah Territory. She walked, most of the time barefoot. The trip was interesting, but often difficult. Christina and her mother and their grandmother cooked food over open fires, usually with sunflower stems or buffalo chips for fuel. Once her sister's clothes caught fire, and she was only saved by the quick action of one of the other pioneers who caught her, rolled her in the dust, and saved her life. And there was always the threat of Indians, who were not always friendly. Once uh, the pioneers camped in a place where a large battle between settlers and natives had taken place years before, the wagons were arranged in a circle, and a guard watched all night, just in case. But the time passed uneventfully. Another time, a band of natives rode horses through their camps, scattering everything in their path. Christina got her first look at her new home on September 20th, 1866, four months to the day from the time they left home. They stayed in Salt Lake City for a few days, then moved to Lehigh, and finally to Alpine, where her uncle lived. He had made the journey four years before and assured them that if they would work hard, they could have a good life in America. Christina's father took up a homestead of 160 acres. He built a one-room adobe house with a sod roof, and Christina told later of the many times when it rained, and they would all take down the curtains and spread them over the beds and other furniture to protect them from the mud that would leak through the roof. There is much more to tell, of course. Christina married and had six children. Two of them, a baby girl a few days old and a two-year-old boy, died in the same week. And after only 14 years of marriage, Christina's husband died suddenly. Life was difficult. She had to manage the farm and the children alone. To supplement their resources, she wove carpets and sold them. Later, she did needlework, which was highly regarded in the community. Years later, she married again, thus gaining a husband and four additional children that had been left when his first wife had died. She lived in a community of Danish immigrants. They helped each other and preserved some of the traditions, the foods, the dances, the customs of the old world. Christina's grandmother, who had come with them, never did learn to speak English. And Christina's grandfather never did follow them to America. Christina lived to be almost 90 years old and was energetic and lively to the end. Her children, grandchildren, and four more generations number in the hundreds and hundreds. Like other members of this generation, I have traveled to Denmark to see the land of Christina's birth, the land she gave up for the new life in America. I have stood on the docks in Copenhagen, where the immigrant ships departed more than 150 years ago. And there beside the water stands a life-size statue of Christina, a young girl, not quite 16, facing west with her hair and skirt blowing out behind her, looking forward to a new life in a new land.